continue on with our study of Romans. And man, it's just, it's chock full of veal cutlet steaks, I'm telling you. It's, it's unbelievable as we study the Word of God. And you remember last week we went through the book, uh, the chapter 1. We talked about many things as far as what sin was about. We talked about the sinfulness of man. We talked about the depravity of man. And what we were getting it to is, why do we need Jesus? Why do we need a Savior? And we realize that, man, we're just lost. We, we realize that since the garden that, that we have failed and we have sinned and we have missed the mark of God's holiness. And he's asked us to, to trust him. He's asked us to believe in the only begotten son of, Jesus, of God, Jesus Christ, to believe in him as Savior and to trust him and to follow him. And all that will do that can sing a song like Beulah Land and, and feel the, the chills and feel the excitement that someday we're going to be reunited with people that we love. We're going to be together with no more sin and no more uh, sickness and all those things. And, and more than all of that, which all that's wonderful, we're going to get to see Jesus. And man, we, we need that. We, we need that in this world today. And we talked about a lot of folks are trying to do this thing on their own without God. And we just looked at some of the the worst of the worst, I guess you'd say. But as we talked about many times, sin is sin. Sin is sin. And this week, we kind of go into to number two, and it talks about the righteousness of God. And it, it's kind of like, you remember last week we talked about what, how do you, how do you view Romans? What, what's it about? And it, it's Paul talking to, to Romans there, but it, it's that conscientious, conscientious objector in the crowd that says, I don't believe that. I don't believe we need a Savior. I don't believe I'm a sinner. I don't believe that I need eternal life. I believe I can get there on my own. And so that's what, who Paul is talking about. Remember that this morning. And this morning we're going to talk to someone that looks at chapter 1 and says, boy, that's some, that's some rough folks. I've never done that, and I've never done that, and I've never done that. I'm talking about people that are not saved. I've never done that. So I'm, I'm pretty good. And there's a lot of people in this world, guys, that are trying to be good enough to get to heaven. They're trying, you know, if you go ask them about giving their heart to Jesus, you ask them about asking Christ to be their Savior, they say, I've got this. I, I'm a good person. I, I, I'm a good moral person. I, I try to help people. I try to do the right thing. And guys, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But the Bible says that God's going to judge on a whole different scale than what we judge on. And see, what we're trying to do is we're saying we're pretty good, and what's our standard there? We're saying I'm pretty good compared to that guy or I'm pretty good compared to that lady, or I'm better than that person. But you know what? When we get to heaven someday and stand before a holy God, you know what the standard's going to be? How we measure up against Jesus Christ. And guys, I don't know about you, but I know that you know that when we're measured up against Jesus Christ, we lose every time. No matter how good we can be, no matter how many good things we do for people, no matter how much we want to to be all that we can be, we cannot measure up to the holiness of Jesus Christ. That's why he had to come and die for us. That's why he had to shed his precious blood. That's why he arose on the third day and offers that to all of us because the only way that we can stand righteous before a holy God, there's just one way, is through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That when he sees us on the day of judgment, that he sees Jesus because if you go in there with your works and you go in there with your, your resume of the things you've done in this world and it doesn't include Jesus, it's not going to stack up. And he'll judge you like that. He'll judge you like that. He'll judge you by your works. But I'm telling you, when you lay out the best resume possible, it's not going to be enough to get you into the gates of heaven. It's only, listen to me, and you've heard me say this a billion times, and I'll say it a billion times more, there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to be face-to-face -face with God and to be righteous, and it's through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. That's not a Baptist thing. That's, not any, that's a Bible thing. That's a Bible thing. That's not Brother Todd making that up. But that's, you know, what happens in this thing is, we, and we're, remember this morning we're talking about judgment of, of the sinner, not judgment of salvation. This is not about salvation in this chapter. This is talking about God judging sinners. And what happens is there's, there's on this side of salvation, all right? On this side of salvation, we're covered by the blood of Jesus. We're sinners, but we're covered by the grace and the blood of Jesus. But on this side, there's sinners. There's sinners that don't know Jesus. 
And their thought is, is, well, there's some way down there, and I'm way up here on the mountain. Somebody needs to go down there and help them people. Somebody needs to give them some clothes or some soup or teach them some ways and teach them some more morals. But, but I'm so much better than that person, I've got to be better off. But you know what? No matter where we are in life, no matter where we are in life, the hurdles to get over to God's righteousness are the same whether you're up here or whether you're down there. Whether you got $5 or $5 million, whether you own all the world or you don't own anything, there's still one standard to get to Jesus, and it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's talking about this morning. He's talking about the judgment of God. God, everyone, and I mean everyone, needs a Savior, period. Listen to this. If we could work our way to heaven, we could be our own Savior, and we wouldn't need Jesus or we wouldn't need Calvary. What we're saying is when we try to work our way to heaven, guys, we try to be good enough, we try to be religious enough and not go through Jesus and not give our heart to him and not sacrifice ourselves to him and die to ourselves. we're saying I didn't need Jesus to come and I didn't need Calvary because I can do this on my own. And the Bible tells me you're wrong. The Bible tells me you're wrong. Let's read Romans 2.1. Romans 2.1. You, therefore, it's talking about lost people, people that think they're better than the lost people that were in the first chapter, all right? We're always judging ourselves with each other. Don't do that. Judge yourself with Christ. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Paul's talking about sin. And the basis by which God will judge man, man is guilty, and to reject God seals his fate. And that's what people say when they say, I don't need the blood of Jesus. I don't need, I'm a good person, Todd. I, I come to church a lot. I grew up in church. And listen, there's a lot of people that grew up in church, and that's good. That's a good thing. But listen to me, you're in so much more light than the person that never stepped into the door that you're going to be condemned even more. Because you've seen the light, you've heard the light, you've heard salvation, and you've chose to say, I can do this on my own. I don't need to give my heart to Jesus. I don't need to go up before people, or I don't need to get on my knees. I don't need to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I can be good enough. And it does not work. It does not work. What's it say in John 3, 17, 18? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is not up there, guys. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. They have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And then at 36 of John, it says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Whoever knows the Son has eternal life. If you know him as your Savior this morning, you have eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son and says, I can get there on my own, that I don't need Jesus, I can go straight to God, you are condemned. You are condemned already. Now, just a side note. Thinking about the terrible things we read in chapter 1, what should be the attitude of one who already knows Jesus as Savior? Let's stop just for a minute. We're talking about sinners that don't know Jesus yet. Well, a lot of us in this room this morning, we know Jesus as Savior. How, what should be our attitude in judging people and talking about people and, and looking at their sin? And yes, sin is awful. And yes, Jesus has asked us to proclaim to defy sin and to flee from sin and to accept him as Savior. But when we look at the atrocities of sin in chapter 1, and we look back, I'll look back with you, you don't have to, uh, what did it say? They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, they're full of evil, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. What should be our position as saved people? You know what our position should be? On our knees, with our eye and our hearts broken, and praying for the lost of this world. Remember in, in the great Sermon on the Mount, it says, Blessed are those who weep and mourn. You know what we're mourning about is the lostness of this world. The, the world that doesn't know Jesus. 
rather than talking about their sin, rather than gossiping about their sin, rather than putting that person down, we are to hit our knees and pray that God would save them. And pray, God, that you would use me to live in such a way that they could see something a little bit different, a little bit peculiar. And as I said to the kids this morning, he asked us, Jesus has asked us to be weird in a world that needs to see some weird people for Jesus. There's a lot of weirdness out there against Jesus, but he needs to see us weird in a good way so people can see the real Jesus Christ. Unity in the church, faithfulness in what we do, serving him, that should be our attitude about judging others. It should break our heart that they don't know Jesus yet, and we do, because it should, it's the heart that Jesus had, amen? It's the heart that Jesus had for the lost. Remember when the woman, they brought to, the woman that had been found in adultery, and they were picking up stones to stone her. And he said, remember he wrote in the, in the dirt. Nobody really knows what he wrote. But he said, you without sin cast the first stone. And he said, one by one, you could hear the stones hitting the ground as they walked off. And they realized that only by the grace of God would they be there. But then he says something that people tend to leave out, and I think is very important at the end of that story. He tells that young lady what? To go and sin no more. Stop it. Change. Repent. Turn from that way and turn toward Jesus. And that's very important, guys. That's very important as we look at that story. Man, what a thing to think about. Remember what Fanny Crosby wrote? Good song we've sung many years. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Weep over the airy ones. Lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. What a powerful song. That should be our view when we look at the lostness of this world. Rescue the perishing. Just like we've been rescued through Jesus, we want to throw that lifeline. There used to be another old song, throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Rescue them through Jesus Christ. That should be our attitude. Rescue the perishing. The last part of, of the verse 1 says, judging our loss. Look at there one more time in 2 verse 1. It says, you who pass judgment do the same things. I've, I've noticed that in my walk with Christ, and I know we're kind of talking salvation compared to sinners where this is mainly talking about sinners, but guys, it's real easy. Isn't it easy to judge others' faults and to think it's all right for you to do that? We're really good at that. Man, can you believe they'd do that? Or can you believe they did that sin? Or can you believe that they've done those kind of things? And guys, if we'll think long enough and we'll look in that mirror just a few moments, the Holy Spirit will bring something to our heart, and we have committed the same thing. Remember what Jesus said, guys. Remember his standard is different than ours. We think if we don't do it, we're better than somebody else. Jesus said if you even thought it, you've done it. And that, separ that, separ that puts us all in the same pile, doesn't it? Sadly, it does. He said, if you've looked at a woman with a lustful thought, you've committed adultery. If you've coveted something that a neighbor has and you've wanted it for your own, you've been a thief. You've done it in your mind. Man, that changes the whole thing. He said, at least you think that you're, you're not guilty. Look at your own life. Look at your own life. Some lost guy will say, well, I'm not as bad as Hitler or Osama bin Laden you know what lost person you'll stand in line just with them and you'll be judged on the same standards that God has what's that standard to believe in his one and only son and you will be judged according to that according to your deeds mm. when we judge other people we assume the position of judge listen to this quote when we judge other people we assume the position of judge God is saying that by the same token that you have the right to judge others by your standards, listen to this, he has the right to judge you by his standards. By the same token, by we sit there and judge others, and by when the lost man judges others and thinks I'm better than them, so I've got to step up on them, Jesus said, if you think you can use standards, I'm going to use my standards. And guys, I don't know about you, but I know about me, I don't want to be judged on my standards, or by God's standards. If we look at that and say, I can be judged by God's standards and can be good enough to get in heaven. I don't think any of us is getting in. I know we're not. I know we're not as we look at that. Romans 2. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. 
The truth of God's word is a two-edged sword. Remember what Revelation 10, 9 and 10 said. Listen to this. Remember that what John wrote. Remember John had been lifted up into heaven, and he was seeing things that's in Revelation, and he was looking at all the events going on. And it says, at first it was sweet and tasty. We talked about the judgment of God. He said, hmm, I know Christ. I know the Lord. It's going to be, it's going to be great. It's sweet and it's tasty. But, you know, and a lot of times when we're studying God's word, we go, oh, I love to study the Bible. Oh, I just love to study the Bible. But then we get into these points where we shouldn't judge. Then we get into points where we're not getting there without Jesus. Then we get into the point where we're all sinners and all fall short of the glory of God. And all means everybody. And all of a sudden, we, it, it kind of sours our stomach. That's what it did to John in Revelation. He said, I took and tasted of the book, and it was sweet. But he said, as I realized the power of God, the awesomeness of God, the mightiness of God, of how far God is up there, and how far I am down here, and how far apart we are, and I can never go over and expand that gulf that, he's, that I've cracked open with sin. He said, it turned bitter in my stomach. It made me sick. It made me nauseous because I realized I'm not near as good as I think I am. I'm not near on the level that God has wanted me. And it makes us really think, remember about his judgments. Acts 17 says this, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Everyone will be judged. Now, there's a couple ways you can go about that. You can just kind of leave your hands off and try to work your way to heaven and don't go through Jesus, and you're going to be judged according to your works. And I, I, as I read in the Bible, guys, none of our works are going to be good enough to get us into heaven. Or you can go through the blood of Jesus, and you can be judged not on your righteousness, listen to me, but on the righteousness of Christ. Because he says when, when we stand before him someday and we're saved, he's going to look at us and he's going to see the blood that covered and, and took away our sins, the righteousness of Christ. And now we are righteous. We are right in God's eyes. And what's he going to say? Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Well, that's going to be sweet. It's going to be sweet. But we're all going to be weighed. Now, I kind of miss the cotton picking air all right, by hand. How many in this room pick cotton with a sack? All right, I see some hands, all right? Now, from what I hear is when you got there with the bag, you threw it up on the scale, and they weighed the cotton, right? They didn't ask you where you got it, how you picked it, or who it belonged to. They just asked you, they just weighed it. Someday when we get to heaven, guys, he's not going to care where you've been, who you're related to, or where you went to church. He's going to weigh your sins. In Daniel, it says this. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Without Jesus, without him taking away our sins, we're going to be found wanting. We're going to, be, we're going to come up short. We're not going to be able to make the quota that Christ has stood before us, has set before us. Never believe the lie from the devil that you will escape judgment. Judgment because I'm not as bad as that guy. See, the devil loves to lie to us. Well, you're not as bad as that guy. And I've heard people say, well, I'm just as good as them people down there at the church. And sadly, that might be true sometimes, all right? Let's just be honest. Sometimes they look at Brother Todd and they go, I'm just as good as him, and you know what, it's right. But you know what? They're not going to get up to heaven in front of God someday in the great white throne judgment. They go, okay, look, we're going to compare you to, to Brother Todd Benson. Once again, who are they going to compare him to? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. And a lot of the devil is using that lie to keep a lot of people from church. He's using that lie to keep a lot of people from coming to know him as Savior because I'm just as good as somebody else. And guys, that's not the way we're going to be judged. It's not the way we're going to be judged. God will judge man for what he is in God's sight. Is that how you want to stand before God? Not me. I want to stand before God with the precious blood of Jesus taking away my sins and being found righteous, not because I'm a great guy, but being found righteous in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the way I want to be found. Verse 3, 
So when you, a mere human being, let me read it. So, you, so when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Remember what we just said? I'm as good as they are. Do you think that's going to help you to get past that, give you a free pass? Oh, oh, I didn't know. Oh, I didn't know you did it a different way. Here, here's a free pass. You don't have to go through the judgment of God. You will. A writer said this. He said there's only four ways for a man to escape who breaks the law. You think about somebody today that broke the law. There's only four ways for them to escape. Here's the four ways. First of all, he hopes he can run off and not be found. All right, you got that? He hopes he cannot be found. Number two, he can escape beyond the jurisdiction of the court. Well, I'll go to Mexico, or I'll, I'll go to Spain, or I'll go to India. I'll, I'll flee the jurisdiction of the court. A third way is, after his arrest, his lawyers can get him off on some kind of technicality. He wasn't read his rights, or, or you know, there was circumstantial evidence, whatever. And number four is, after conviction, he escapes and stays undercover. That's only the four ways I know to escape. Now, think about those things and escaping the judgment of God. Think about this. None of these avenues will work. Why? Because men cannot escape beyond God's knowledge. He knows where everybody is. He knows everything. God cannot escape beyond, a man cannot escape beyond God's reach. You can't go far enough to get away from God. And you're certainly not going to get away from God's judgment over a technicality because he's a perfect judge. And the other thing is, you will never be able to escape his judgment. Never will you be able to escape his judgment. Listen to what Hebrews 2, 3 says. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? Think about that a minute. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? Here it is. God has an escape plan. I, I read the other day, y'all ever seen Shawshank Redemption? I, I've seen that movie a bunch of times. They found that guy the other day. After 50-some years, they caught him. He'd been escaped and running all these years. And they found him living off somewhere else. He'd got a new Social Security number and everything. But, but you know, I thought of the old, the old saying that be sure your sins will find you out. But you think about God has an escape plan. You do not have to go through the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is this. In the back of Revelation, everyone that is lost, everyone that has never given their heart to Jesus will someday stand before God and be a judge according to their works. And he said, but wait, you can escape that judgment. How do you escape that judgment? Through the salvation of Jesus Christ. Because I believe, I believe the Bible teaches that someday soon that the church is going to be called home. See, we're in the engagement period. We, we were reminded that yesterday at the wedding. The, the, the preacher there said, this is what we're seeing is, is, a, is what was going to happen to the church someday. Because the church is the bride of Christ. And someday he's going to come and receive his bride. Right now he's asking us to get ready. You know, like some of you ladies, went as you get ready for your wedding, you was preparing and you was getting all this stuff ready and man, you were just picking out the dress and all the things that you do. You were excited about that day when you got to be called Mr. Whoever, Mr. and Mrs. Whoever. And so now, when we know Jesus, we're in that engagement period. And someday soon, I believe, he's going to come and, and he's going to rapture his church. He's going to say it's time for the wedding, for the marriage feast of the Lamb. And he's going to gather all the believers together, and he's going to take us home. I was reading this week that 57% of Christians believe that will happen before 2050. Now, we know, have no idea when it's going to happen. The Bible says no one knows. But I believe more and more people are thinking it could be any time. And if you come and study our, our blood moon study with us, there's nothing left that keeping the rapture from happening just this next second. There's nothing. There's nothing. But yet I look around, and we're all living like we've got forever. What if you knew you only had 10 years to live? What if you knew it was only five years before Jesus come back? 
and you really knew that, what if you knew Jesus was coming back next week? Would that change the way you'd live? How come it doesn't? We talk all the time, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. I can't wait. He's coming back. Beautiful land, sweet beautiful land. But we live like there's, there's going to be many, many tomorrows. We live like it's not important to tell our kids about Jesus. We live like it's, there's always something else to do besides come to church. Guys, this is a time, I think, in ever a time in our human history that we need to be pumping every bit of Jesus into our kids and into our families that we possibly can. Because I believe over the next many years, there's going to be a lot of delusion. There's going to be a lot of falsehoods. There's going to be a lot of things that's going to try to lie to us through the devil. And we better know Jesus. We better know him. How can we escape so great a salvation? This salvation was the first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to those who heard him. Guys, you just think about escape clause. We have an escape way. That alone should just make us run to the knees of Jesus. You know what? It should make us run to the feet of Jesus. His goodness, that he would give us an escape. He didn't have to do that. He'd give us everything perfect in the garden and we didn't want it. He could have just said, I'm, I'm, I'm through with you. But he came back through his son and he came to this earth and he bore all the things that men have to bear and all the sadness and sickness and lost loved ones. And The Bible said there's nothing that Jesus has went through that you will go through. He's went through everything you will. And just knowing that, it should just make us want to run to the feet of Jesus and just grab onto his legs and say, thank you. Thank you for loving me so much. What can I do for you today? But we take it for granted. We get saved and we check it off our list and we think, I got that done. Now I'm going to go enjoy life. And guys, that's nothing about what he asked us to do. It's nothing about what he asked us to do. Listen to this quote the old preacher said. Man, this is something. This is in your face. Think about it. You're sitting here today thinking, I'm good. I'm good to go. I don't need Jesus. Here's what he said. If you're putting all your hope in this world, you better suck this earth like it's an orange <laughs> and get all you can get out of it. Drink all you can, eat all you can, and sin all you can because you won't have anything in the next life. You better get all you can get if that's what you want. Eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die. Listen to me. Listen to me in this crowd today if you're lost. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, you need a Savior. Amen? You need a Savior. I need a Savior. You need a Savior. If you're dependent on this world to satisfy you, if you're dependent on this world to excite you and to get you all that you want, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die. And we all got to go through that door. It's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. Guys, don't leave here. Don't leave this place today without knowing the precious love and know the precious salvation that Jesus offers. Don't leave here today without your pass to escape his judgment. Because I believe the Bible teaches that everyone that knows him as Savior will not pass before him to be judged, we will pass before him for our rewards. And we're going to be judged, I think, more in what we haven't done for him than what we've done against him because all of our sins have been forgiven and they're remembered no more. You think about standing before God. We'll read a little bit more next week. But you think about him, and, and later on in the chapter it says, in one of these days, every secret of your heart will be made public. The things you think nobody knows. The things that you think I've got away with. The things that only you thought, but nobody knows you thought that. God says that someday before the great white throne judgment for the lost of the world, every little secret will come out. I don't want people to know all my secrets. That's why you go through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'll remove your sins and I'll remember them no more I'll remember the secrets no more I'll remember the times you failed no more 
I'll remember the times that you had all those thoughts no more. Guys, that's, that's the line I want to get in. And that's the line I want you to get in. Please, if you're lost here this morning, don't think you can be better than someone and God will let you through. He's laid out the plan. It's pretty straightforward. It's not hard to understand. He said, you got to come to him like a child, just childlike faith, and say, I believe in you, Jesus Christ. I believe you love me. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. And I believe you want to save me and take away every sin that I have. And you want to forgive me. And someday soon, I can stand before you in heaven righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what you got to do this morning. And then you live for him. You live for him. It's pretty straightforward. It's not hard. It's just that we want to make it more than it is. Hey, thanks for joining us today. If you have prayer requests, need to contact us, or need directions to the church, check us out online at fbckaiser.com. If you want to join us, we're located at 210 East Main Street, or give us a call at 870-526-2604, or send mail to P.O. Box 306, Kaiser, Arkansas, 72351. We'd love to see you soon. Thanks again for joining us, and may God bless you.